we're going to go ahead and um, get started with some notes before we begin our, um, our presentation today. Um, my name is Amanda and I work at the Heinz History Center. Um, I have some colleagues joining us uh, today who are helping out in the chat. Um, just a note about the chat, first of all, because I see lots of people saying hello in there, uh, and I like to say hello and good morning. Um, we are using the chat in such a way that you will just be able to talk to us panelists. So students will not be able to see what each other, uh, what you're all saying. You just are talking to us here who are running uh, the show this morning. Um, we are not able to see any of you at all. None of you will appear on camera. Your names won't show up on anything in this. Uh, I also want to let you know that we are recording this presentation um, so that you all can watch this later. It'll end up on YouTube. Um, you can talk to us in the chat if you have questions or you want to answer some of the things that we ask this morning. The chat is your way to do that. So again, that's just talking directly to us. Everyone can't see what you're saying in there. Um, and you can also ask us questions in the Q&A section. Now, my colleagues Laura and Jocelyn are um, uh, on the call, you may not see them, but they are behind the scenes. They'll be answering some things in the chat in the question and answer section for you. Um, they'll also be putting some instructions in there about how to turn on closed captioning today. If you would like to see the live captioning while I'm talking, you'll be able to do that as well. Um, someone just asked, you can't hear us, right? And that's correct. I can't hear you. I can, the only way that you can tell me anything is through the chat. Um, or the Q&A section. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and get started here in just a second. Um, I am going to share my screen and we're gonna talk all about a very special part of Pittsburgh's history this morning. We are gonna talk about Pittsburgh's history of the Underground Railroad. Um, these programs that we're doing uh, every Thursday this month are for Black History Month. Um, but I want to say before we get started that at the History Center, we talk about this stuff all the time. These Black history stories are part of everything that we do at the Heinz History Center, not just during February, uh, but all year round. So um, what we're talking about today is a special program about a special person who came through Pittsburgh as part of his journey on the Underground Railroad back in the 1840s. And so we're gonna start off by sort of setting the scene of what um, Pittsburgh was like at the time, and then we're gonna jump into his story. So um, I'm gonna go ahead and share my screen and we can get into it. Okay, can Jocelyn or Laura just let me know that that looks right before I get started here? Looks good. Awesome, thank you so much. Okay, so I put up this map here um, of where we are in this sort of Northeast part of the United States, just because I think there might be some people joining us today who are not from Pittsburgh. Um, and also so that we can keep in mind that where we are is really important to this story. So Pittsburgh is located right here. This line here is the sort of Southern border of Pennsylvania. And below that line, when we're um, talking about the Underground Railroad, uh, lots of people were trying to get across that line and up into Pennsylvania as part of the Underground Railroad um, so that they could try to make their way all the way probably up here to Lake Erie so that they could cross into Canada. The reason for that is that below this line, there were people who were living um, uh, as enslaved people on plantations. Those are the people who were trying to escape and get to freedom up here in these northern states, including Pennsylvania. So I just thought it's important to make sure that we see where we are in space here. This is West Virginia, Ohio, and a little bit of Maryland coming down there. I also wanted to make sure that I put up a picture of where we, where we really are more specifically. I picked this beautiful picture of what Pittsburgh looks like in the summertime when it's sunny. This is not what it looks like if you look outside right now in Pittsburgh, but um, this picture gives us a nice sense of the rivers that are here in Pittsburgh. These rivers are really important to the story of the Underground Railroad too, because they gave people a way to move very quickly and easily through this region. So they could use um, that, those rivers to, to travel around very quickly. 
and this is a picture of where the museum is, our museum that we work at, in case you've never been there. Um, you should come and visit sometime. I hope we can all see you in real life someday, but um, that's what the Heinz History Center looks like, and that's where we all work. Um, so we're going to get into talking about some of the words that I will use when I talk about this story. Um, and these words are really, really important. We use these words specifically at the museum to make sure that we're um, talking about people in a way um, that helps us to remember that they were people. So throughout this presentation, you're going to hear me use the words enslaved person or enslaved people instead of choosing to use the word slave. Uh, and that's something that we do at the museum a lot because it helps us to remember that those people were people, right? They had feelings, they had lives, uh, they had friends and, um, you know, they, they were people. They weren't just what we would call a slave. So a lot of people have started changing how they say that and that's what we've done at the museum. So you'll hear me say enslaved person or enslaved people when I'm talking about uh, what are sometimes called slaves. You'll also hear me use this word freedom seeker. And freedom seeker is what a lot of people are calling um, people who were sometimes called runaway slaves or escaped slaves or uh, fugitive slaves. Um, so at the museum, if you come to visit us someday, you'll see that we always use the word freedom seeker. And that's because we want you all to be thinking about the fact that those people, when they left the plantation, they were not slaves anymore. They were not enslaved anymore. They had made a really difficult decision to leave a plantation and leave what they knew and go out into the unknown. And so we're gonna talk about a person who went through that today and get a little more um, idea of what that was like for them, but we always call those people freedom seekers. Another word you'll hear me use today is abolitionist. It's quite a big word. Um, but abolitionists were people who were working to end slavery. So they could be um, black people who were helping other people to get to slavery. They could be white people who were living in the North or in the South who just thought that slavery was very wrong. Um, all of these people who worked in very different ways to try to end slavery. And of course, we're gonna talk about the Underground Railroad. Now, the Underground Railroad, sometimes when people hear that word, that phrase, they think it must have been something like a subway, like a train system that's underground. And of course, that's not what the Underground Railroad was. Um, what it really was is sort of a secret network of, of different people and different hideout places um, that these enslaved people or these freedom seekers could use to escape and to try to get to the north or to get to Canada. Um, so it wasn't very organized. It was just sort of people helping out however they could and sort of connecting people to other people. Um, so it wasn't a train or anything like that. Um, it was just sort of a, a network of people who were helping these freedom seekers get to um, safety. Now, I wonder at this point if we can ask if anyone knows anything already about the Underground Railroad that they wanna share with us before we get started. So you can put these answers in the chat and then Jocelyn and Laura can sort of read them out to me. Um, so if you want to tell us anything you already know about the Underground Railroad, it can be a person whose name you know, it can be a fact that you've learned already, anything you've got. Let's see if we can read a couple out here. I see the name Harriet Tubman came up. Oh, very good. Harriet Tubman, yep. Yeah. She was a person who helped a lot of people on the Underground Railroad. Yeah. Many people recognize that name. I see a couple of attendees who have their hands up. We're not going to have a chance to unmute, but do type your answers in the chat, okay? Black people were trying to escape and white people helped them. Um, yeah, absolutely. Black people also helped other black people. That's something we'll talk about in this presentation too. But yeah, there were a lot of white people who were helping them. Someone researched Susan B. Anthony and thought that she might have a connection too. She might. We have a few people in the Q&A saying Abraham Lincoln. Ah, so Abraham Lincoln is important to the story um, because it was, it was his um, emancipation proclamation that, that sort of ended slavery for a lot of people. Absolutely. Oh, I saw a good one, Sir John, Sir John or Truth. Ooh, yeah, very good. 
and someone's asking why did they go to Canada and we'll get into that a little bit later. We will. Some people were mad Black people were escaping, but abolitionists said, we don't care, we're doing what's right. Absolutely. Yeah, some people were mad that these freedom seekers were escaping um, and, and tried to get them back. A lot of uh, people would put out all these newspaper ads to try to get people to turn them in. They were not happy. We have some local connections being made. Someone says that the Underground Railroad went through Shaler. Ah, yeah, lots of local connections. Can take maybe one more and then we'll move on. I see the names Frederick Douglass and Charlie Garlick. Yes, we're gonna talk all about Charlie Garlick, but Frederick Douglass was an important um, abolitionist who talked a lot about the Underground Railroad and, and helped out himself um, and made a lot of speeches and wrote newspapers about um, why slavery should end. Absolutely, really important person to that story. All right, I can see the chat still having lots of comments in there. You all can keep uh, going ahead and sharing with Laura and Jocelyn, but I'm gonna go ahead and move on in our conversation here just so that um, we are mindful of time. Um, so we're gonna move on from these key words. I just wanna show you this picture here quickly. I'm not gonna get too into this, but. This is a map of downtown Pittsburgh. Well, today it's downtown Pittsburgh. So there's those rivers and that point that you saw in that first picture. And this is just showing um, a, a map of where there were black people living here in Pittsburgh in the 1830s. So this is from 1836. This is a little bit before the story that we're really gonna get into, but um, it tells us that there were lots and lots of free African-American people living here in Pittsburgh. That becomes really important when we talk about the Underground Railroad because a lot of those people, those free black people who were living here were the people who ended up helping and, and, and helping people get to safety as part of the Underground Railroad. So lots of them living, especially lots of black people in the this sort of East Ward here that is now almost part of what we would call the Hill District, sort of where the, um, the hockey arena is there and lots of people living up here along the shore of the Allegheny River. Um, so we'll see those places become important in our story in a moment. And these are some of the uh, newspaper ads that some of these Black uh, residents of Pittsburgh were putting up about their businesses. And we'll get into this a little bit later too. Lots of these free Black people who were living here were very wealthy. They had really successful businesses and they were doing really well. That doesn't mean that life was easy for them. They were still often treated differently to the white residents of Pittsburgh. They uh, kind of had their own community where they stuck together and supported one another, um, but they were prospering and, and, and succeeding here in Pittsburgh. So keep that in mind as we get into our story. And of course, our story is about Charlie Garlic or Charles Garlic. Um, he is really, really important because he is a person who experienced the Underground Railroad. He went through the process of being a freedom seeker, leaving a plantation, trying to get to uh, safety and to freedom. And then at the end of his life, he took the time to sit down and write his story. And that is so important because so many people who went through this experience of the Underground Railroad never really did that. Uh, and so as historians, we don't have many of these sources where people who went through that experience can tell us about what it was like for them and what they did. We have Charlie Garlicks, which is amazing because he comes right through Western Pennsylvania on his journey to freedom in Ohio. And it's also really important as we'll learn at the end here, because often when people did this, when they went through the Underground Railroad or they got their freedom in whatever way, they ended up changing their name and that makes it really hard for historians to trace them through the historic record. So you'll see at the end how we know about some of these people and what happened to them. Um, but it's hard if we don't know what name they chose once they were free. We know what name Charlie Garlic chose once he was free and that's really, really important. So his story is, is uh, probably a story that a lot of people had. We just don't have much evidence of those stories unless we are reading things like what Charlie Garlic has written. Um, so Charlie Garlic, when he was an old man, as you can see 
uh, in the picture here. Um, he wrote a book, a short book, sort of a pamphlet, really, I guess, um, that is uh, the story of his life. And he called his book, this is a very long title, Life, Including His Escape and Struggle for Liberty of Charles A. Garlick, born a slave in Old Virginia, who secured his freedom by running away from his master's farm in 1843. Now, he was uh, living in, he says Old Virginia here. Uh, what he means by that is West Virginia. So Virginia and West Virginia used to be the same state and they split up. Um, so when he says Old Virginia, he's talking about West Virginia. Um, and what we're gonna do is I'm gonna put up a map of the journey that he followed. And we're gonna share his own words from the book that he wrote about his life. And we're gonna sort of trace the story uh, using the map to show where he went, what happened to him at these different places, uh, and where he ended up. So we're going to go ahead and get started here with this map. Now, if you remember when I showed you that map at the very beginning, Pittsburgh is about right here. And we had that border here, this southern border that a lot of people were trying to get across because Pennsylvania is a state uh, that was what we call a free state. There was not much slavery here. Uh, and so um, Charlie Garlic and people like him were trying to cross this line into Pennsylvania. And you'll notice all these little lanterns here. These lanterns are places where um, something on the Underground Railroad happened to Charlie Garlic. So we're gonna start out where he started out, which is down here. And I'm gonna read out some of his own words that he wrote in his book. So he starts his story by saying this, I, Abel Bogus, now Charles A. Garlick, was born near Shinston, West Virginia, about the middle of February, 1827, on the plantation of Richard Bogus. My parents were slave laborers on the farm. And then he says, I had 11 brothers and sisters when I left the old home for the North and the freedom that I so often dreamed of. I was 16 years old and it was fully 40 years after I threw off the yoke of bondage and became a free man before I again saw any members of my immediate family. Um, he then says he had an older brother, Raleigh, who he did see uh, who left just before him. So this gives us an idea of what Charlie's life was like before he made this decision to leave. Uh, he was 16 years old when he did this. Um, and um, he uh, took off from Shinston. Um, so he started off traveling with some of his family, but then his family decided to turn back and go back to the plantation. But they sent him on saying, you can make it. If you're, you're young, uh, you, you can do this. And they sent him off and said, go for it. Um, try to get to freedom if you can. And so he set off pretty much on his own um, into the unknown really. And that's why we use that word freedom seeker, because he was a person who had made a very brave decision to go and seek his own freedom. And that meant sacrificing a lot of things. He had to leave behind his family and, and everything that he knew. Um, so that's why we use that word to sort of keep that in our minds. So he goes from Shinston. Uh, he leaves on a Saturday night. Uh, he hides out for a few days, not far from the plantation, actually. Uh, but then he finds out that there are people coming after him and he needs to make a move. So um, from there, someone tells him that he can try to make his way up into a place called Uniontown, Pennsylvania. So if you watch that map there, his first journey is going up from West Virginia just into Pennsylvania, where he gets to Uniontown. And here's what he says at Uniontown. The Underground Railroad was brought into use wherever possible. And I sometimes used the stations to hide from my pursuer. It took one week to reach Uniontown. There I lay hidden in the barn of a friend of my race who provided me with food until three days later when it was safe for me to continue my journey. Um, so it took him a week to just travel this far because the whole time he's having to hide and be very careful. And he's probably traveling overnight and sleeping in the daytime so that he can hide in the dark. Um, and he hid out in Uniontown for uh, three days with another black person who, who helped him out until he could get uh, a way to get to the next place. 
And you may be able to guess by the map that the next place that he gets to is Pittsburgh. Um, and so this is where the story gets really important to us locally. So I'm going to put up a map here of downtown sort of Pittsburgh around the time that Charlie Garlic was around in this area as part of the Underground Railroad. So we have the rivers here, like you maybe saw in that picture at the beginning. This whole area today is downtown where we have our great big tall buildings, but back then this was a really small city. And so this is pretty much where everyone was living, where all the businesses were, and all of these stars that you see on this map are places where we know as historians that there was uh, someone helping on the Underground Railroad. So those stars mark where um, someone was hiding people until they could get to the next stop uh, as part of the Underground Railroad network. So these people who were helping down here especially, these are those free Black people who lived here in the city who were helping other Black people to get to freedom. Um, this Avery College that you see up here was uh, up on the north side of Pittsburgh. And that person, the person who ran that was a white abolitionist named Charles Avery. But a lot of these people were black people helping uh, people get to, to safety and to freedom. And so the person that he mentions um, is this person here. And so what Charlie Garlic says about Pittsburgh is this. He says, I rode rapidly towards Pittsburgh, which I reached the following night. Bashan kept a station on the Underground Railroad, and here I found refuge for three days. He was a gentleman of wealth, and hundreds of my race have cause to bless his memory for the help he gave them in their efforts to find freedom. And this is really, really important um, to how we know about the Underground Railroad here in Pittsburgh, because Charlie Garlic mentions a specific person there, this Bashan this John Vachon, um, who ran a barber shop. John Vachon was a very wealthy person um, and uh, he helped a lot of people. And we, we know that from a lot of sources, but it's really, really great to hear Charlie Garlic mention a specific name because not a lot of people would have done that. In the time that the Underground Railroad, Railroad was happening, no one would have wanted to tell the names of the people who were helping people to get to safety because it was a really dangerous thing that they were doing. They could get in a lot of trouble. Um, they could have um, these um, sort of like slave catchers come up and, and try to get people from them if they knew that they were helping. It was really, really dangerous. So Charlie Garlic mentions this long after the Underground Railroad is over, but even then a lot of people who ended up writing their stories didn't wanna name names of who helped them out just to keep people safe. But, Charlie Garlic felt comfortable mentioning John Vachon, uh, which is great because it means now we know of a person who was helped out by this, uh, this local person. Um, so here's a picture of John Vachon. Uh, and um, he had lots of ads in the newspapers in the 1830s about his shaving, hairdressing, and fancy establishment. Um, so he was a barber, but he did all sorts of uh, fancy things. Um, and he also ran the city baths, which was sort of like a spa that wealthy people could go to and be pampered. Um, so he made lots of money off of that and then used that business at night to hide freedom seekers and help them get to their next stop. So it's great that we have that information from Charlie Garlic as he comes through Pittsburgh. Now he goes up again from Pittsburgh and carries on. He doesn't stay here in the city um, Charlie Garlic is really trying to get to Canada, and so he stays here for a few days, and then he needs to march on to his next place. And so if we look at the map here, we can see that he goes up to this stop here, which is in Butler County, and he hid there with someone for um, a little while, uh, about a week, and then from there, he had to carry on even further. And so from there, he says, after many days of traveling, I arrived in Ohio. I then left my location on foot, reaching Anson Kirby Garlic's home an hour later. After a night there, I planned to continue my journey to Canada, but he asked me to remain with him and go to school. In the South, I had not attended school two days when the master found it out and stopped my efforts to get an education. 
And this is another moment where we get a really important part of Charlie Garlick's story. Not only did he want to get to freedom and get to Canada, he was a very intelligent man and he wanted to become educated. And so his plan was to um, carry on up to Canada and figure things out once he got there. But Mr. Garlick, whose name he ends up taking on, um, asked him to stay and go to school in Ohio um, because Mr. Garlick knew that there were lots of people in that part of Ohio who were um, helping these freedom seekers and, and really all black people to become educated. So where Charlie Garlick mentions that he wasn't allowed to go to school in the South, it was actually illegal in a lot of the South to teach an African-American person to read and write. And so it was really important for Charlie Garlick that he get that opportunity um, and, and he ended up being able to get it in Ohio. So from where he ends up up here in Ashtabula or sort of that area, that's that word here, Ashtabula, um, from Ashtabula, Ohio, he ends up being able to, um, he stays there for about three years with Mr. Garlic, and he stays in that area and he goes to school in the wintertime and then he helps out on their farm in the summertime. And then in 1847, he gets another opportunity where he goes to college. Now this place over here is just a little bit off the map that we have to show you, um, but it's called Oberlin. And Oberlin College was a really, really famous place um, for African-American people. It's still a college today, but this is what it looked like in 1846, just a few little buildings there. Um, and Charlie Garlick is one of a class of about 60 black men who end up going to Oberlin College um, in, in a part of the college that they called Liberty Hall. And so he goes to school in Oberlin. Um, he's only there for a little while because he gets sick uh, and has to go back home. Um, but Oberlin College is a really important part of his story because it was a place where a lot of abolitionists sent their children. So Frederick Douglass, who I know you all mentioned at the beginning here, uh, actually sent his children, his daughter to Oberlin College. Lots of the other Pittsburgh abolitionists sent their kids there. Um, it was a very proudly uh, mixed town. So lots of different people were moving to Oberlin to go to school there. Um, and the people who lived there really liked being diverse like that. And so Charlie Garlic went there for a year in 1847, but then he got sick and had to go back home. Um, but it was an important moment in his life to be part of that, uh, that so many other people got to experience. And then after he goes back home to Ashtabula, um, Mr. Garlic, uh, the person who helped him out in the first place, ends up uh, dying. Uh, he was older. Um, and then they end up selling the house, and that's all happening around 1850. That's an important date in this story, 1850, because it's at that time that Charlie Garlick decides to go to Canada. And lots and lots of other Black people in America at that same time also went to Canada. Um, there was a, a law passed at that time that was called the Fugitive Slave Act or the Fugitive Slave Law. And that meant that a lot of Black people were very nervous in this country uh, because the law said that if um, anyone was caught helping a freedom seeker, they would get in a lot of trouble. Uh, it made it illegal completely to help a freedom seeker um, and to help people leaving plantations to get to safety. And so what it really meant for people like Charlie Garlick was that he had to be very careful that someone didn't come up into Ohio and find him and know that he had escaped and try to return him to slavery, even though it had been years since he went through the Underground Railroad. Um, so it caused a lot of fear with Black people in America. He went to Canada, lots of others did too. He worked in Canada for a winter and then he came back to uh, Ohio. And this is where he lived when he came back to Ohio. So this is a little house here in a place called Jefferson, Ohio. Um, the house was the office of a lawyer named Joshua Giddings, who was a famous abolitionist as well. So this is what it looked like when Charlie Garlick was here. If you look up this place, there's a really cool picture uh, that I couldn't get into this of Charlie Garlick sitting on a chair right in front of this building. Um, and then 
this is what it looks like if you were to go visit it today. They moved the house to a different location so they could save it. Um, and it's a little museum, but that is the house that Charlie Garlic was in when he was writing the book um, that we have been talking about. So really, really important story. Of course, he spends most of his time in Ohio, but that story of traveling through this area and naming some of the people that helped him is really, really important. Um, I'm gonna skip over that one and go to this. Um, before I get into this last little bit here, um, Jocelyn and Laura, were there any things in the chat that we should go over before I move on or any questions about Charlie Garlic's journey that we should answer? I think there are some good ones. Someone asked, did Charlie Garlic have a map? Oh, Charlie Garlic would not have had a map. Um, and this is something that a lot of people always ask about with the Underground Railroad. Like, how did they know where they were going and how did they know where to go next? And the answer is they really didn't. Um, so he would have known to go north at the first instance. And then from then on, it was sort of people directing him to, you know, follow this road until you get to the gray house on the left. And at that house, someone will help you. It was very loosely organized like that. Good question. Um, there's a few more questions about his journey about like, how long was it? And did he walk all the way? He walked most of the way. So he mentions that he gets to Pittsburgh on a horse. Uh, there's somewhere else where someone takes him in like a, a cart or a wagon for a little while. Um, but he also talks in his book about like hiding basically on the side of a road for a couple of days until someone else comes to get him. Um, so uh, he would have walked most of it. Um, I've never really pieced together exactly how long each section would have taken him to add it together, but definitely, you know, I would guess a couple months um, to get from where he was to get up into Ohio. Um, there are a few questions about, did the per person that owned him ever find him? No, so there, were, there was a close call that he had that he writes about with uh, a different uh, slaveholder coming up to try to catch people, but um, he had people coming after him for a while, but they never caught him. Um, sorry, I'm just trying to sort through some of the questions. <laughs> I can see there's a lot in there. <laughs> Let's see. So there was another question about why people that were helping them would be in trouble or why people that would help them on the Underground Railroad would be in danger, sorry. Yes, uh, that's a good question. So um, the people who were helping, so those abolitionists like John Vachon with his barbershop, um, they could get in trouble because especially after 1850, it was illegal to hide freedom seekers and, and help them. Um, but before 1850, they could get in trouble because a lot of these, especially the larger plantations where the slaveholders had a lot of people, when people escaped, they really went after them. And so people like John Vachon uh, could have someone come to where they are and, and threaten them or harm them in some way because they were helping these freedom seekers. Um, so it was, it was a really, really dangerous position to be in. A lot of people have said, you know, we're doing it anyway. This is the right thing to do. Um, but they, they could have had people come after them or they could have gotten in trouble with the law. Um, we had another really good question and I seem to have lost it. Oh, no. I've got one. Oh. Oh, you got it there, Jocelyn? The one, the last one I'll ask is, why, was he alive when slavery was abolished? He was, yeah. Um, so he lived until 1912. Um, so he lived quite a few years after the Civil War and after the end of slavery. And I'll tell you a little more about that part of his story in a second here, uh, because we have some good documents uh, that we've dug up that help us tell that part of his story. I think we can take <laughs> one more before we get into that, if anyone's got one. Yeah, I noticed that there was a question about what did he eat and drink as he made his way north um, on the Underground Railroad? Good question. Very good question. Um, and he mentions a couple of times that, for instance, when he's hiding in Uniontown, he says that the person who hid him brought him food every day and sort of checked on him. Um, 
he might mention that because it was unusual, right? And that he, when that wasn't happening, he would kind of have to fend for himself. Um, so there's a section in our museum where we talk about this and, and what people would have had to know about the natural world around them in order to survive on their journey. Uh, so Charlie Garlick didn't have to travel really that far before he got into Pennsylvania, but for people who were coming from further south and had more distance to cover, they would have had to know what plants you can eat, what plants you definitely should not eat, uh, what plants you could use for medicine, where you can find fresh water, um, all of these things that they would have had to know so they could actually make it to the north. Um, so a lot of things that they had to think about on the way, including food. Absolutely. Good questions, everyone. Um, I'm going to go ahead and move us on into this last little section. We just have a few minutes left here. Um, and this last section is about what else can we learn about Charlie Garlic? So we have his words, uh, which are so valuable and so important. Um, but there are other ways that we can learn about Charlie Garlic. And so we really like to research as historians. Uh, and we did some research. Uh, where we figured out that we could look him up in the census. Now, the census is something that happens um, where we count everyone in the country. And you might be aware of this because last year, 2020, was a census year. Um, so we count everyone who lives in the country. We write down their name, their address, everything about them like that. And it happens every 10 years. And so if you can follow the census, you can really tell a person's story with these little bits of information every 10 years. We can also look up people's military records to see if they uh, served in the military at all. So we looked up Charlie Garlick's military records. And we can also use newspapers to trace their story. And so if we look at some of the census information that we find for Charlie Garlick, we learn some really important things. So some of those are primary sources, right? These give us a little bit of insight, uh, some like hard evidence uh, that is sort of first person about these people's lives. So the census record gives us information like this. So this picture I've put up here, it looks like a big spreadsheet, like an Excel file. And that's basically what it is, sort of a old fashioned Excel sheet um, that is the 1830 census. And so this census was taken when Charlie Garlick was still living on the plantation, when he was still an enslaved person. And what this tells us, you see these lines that I've put up here, this is the name of the head of the family. So that's Richard Bogus. And if you remember from the beginning of his story, he said that his name was Abel Bogus, now Charles A. Garlick. And so when Charlie Garlick was born, Richard Bogus, the slaveholder, named him Abel. And he took the last name of, of the slaveholder. And so you can see here, this, this Richard Bogus has two males, living in his house. And this line here is about slaves, enslaved people. So he's got um, seven, eight uh, enslaved people living. And that's Charlie Garlick's family that we can see here in this census information from 1830. Um, so the important part of the story of, of Charlie Garlick changing his name is that if we didn't know that he changed his name from Abel Bogus to Charlie Garlic once he was free, we wouldn't be able to trace his story any further because we wouldn't know what name to be looking for when we were trying to find him. But because he changed his name uh, and then wrote about it later, we can now go back into these historic documents and find him. Um, so we can look up the name Charlie Garlic. This uh, is a census sheet from Ashtabula, which is where he was up by Lake Erie. Um, this was in October of 1850. And you can see here, his name appears right here, Charles Garlick. He was 25. He was a man. That B indicates that he was black. He's working as a laborer. And this is about his place of birth here. He was born in Virginia. And something I really like about this sheet and, and sort of trying to understand his story a little bit more, we see his line there. The people who are on the lines near him are also living either with him or they're like next door neighbors. And if we look at that, we see this, there's this other person right above him who's 33 and a black man from Tennessee. And then right below him, 
this other person is 22 years old, a black man from Virginia. And that makes me think that when Charlie Garlic is living in Ashtabula in 1850, there are other freedom seekers living right there with him. Um, and so when you look at this whole sheet, uh, it's all white people except for those three black men living there, uh, all having been born in the South. And so that makes me think he's got a little community around him of other freedom seekers. The last piece of Charlie Garlic's story here is this. Um, this is part of his military records. And this is, you see up here, it says USCT, and that stands for United States Colored Troops. And that was a part of the military during the Civil War, part of the Northern Army, where Black people, Black men, were allowed to, for the first time really, be part of the US military, and they were fighting against the South. And so Charlie Garlick, as a grown, grown man, he's about 40 years old, he joined the US colored troops and ended up fighting in the Civil War. Um, and this says down here that he was, uh, he ended up in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, fighting as part of a, um, a specific part of the military. Um, and so when he was an old man, he got a pension from having been part of the military that gave him some money. Um, and, and this I think is a really interesting part of his story uh, too, that he was, he was part of uh, this, this movement to end slavery, not only as a freedom seeker, but also as part of the Civil War. And that is the last little piece there. Um, we are just about out of time, uh, but I'm going to stop my screen share here. And if anyone has any more questions, we can probably do one or two before we have to end. Hey, Amanda. Yes. <laughs> You're all by yourself there. Um, I, am. <laughs> I think Jocelyn and I are trying to sort through the questions that we've got. We've got some great comments as well. Um, so I would encourage people to throw any last questions into the Q&A. Um, there is a question actually about how to find the recording of the Zoom. Yes, so I'm going to, once this is all done here, I'm going to email this link, the link to the um, recording to all the teachers who signed up today. And it will also be on YouTube on Monday, on the History Center's YouTube page um, at some point on Monday. And I saw a question too about are the documents available, those census documents. Um, we are going to put them together in uh, a way that can go out to teachers is something we've been working on for a little while. So um, if I can get that together soon, what I'll do is when it's on YouTube, I can put a link to that in the description of the video on YouTube. And I will let teachers know when that happens. Um, one thing I want to uh, just make sure we get out there too while we're maybe taking another question or two from the chat and the Q&A is there's a Kahoot quiz that goes with this as well. Um, so in a second here, we're going to put some instructions uh, and the links to those cahoots in the chat. Uh, students, if you're going to do those um, cahoot quizzes, um, you'll get the link there. Uh, we just ask that you make sure you name yourself in a specific way when you go to cahoot. It'll ask you for a nickname. If you can put your nickname as your name, your first name, and then some way to abbreviate your school name. Um, so teachers, you may want to give your students what initials to use for the school name um, so that we know on our end uh, who, which students go with which school so we can tell you all who did really well on the Kahoot quizzes at the end here. Those Kahoot quizzes are going to be open until March. So you've got a lot of time if you want to go ahead and look at those. Um, but we will uh, put the links in the chat here in just a second. And I will also email those around uh, this afternoon to all the teachers. So I'm seeing a lot of questions about later on in his life. Like, did he ever see his family again? He did find some of his family. Um, so um, he ended up, and I might have to go back and check this in the book, but um, he mentions that he, he did end up being able to reconnect with a lot of his siblings and his mother. Um, and his brother actually lived in Youngstown, Ohio, which is not too far from where he was in Ashtabula or Jefferson. So. Um, he had a brother that he, he probably saw pretty regularly. 
and did he ever get married and how old was he when he arrived in the south so that's kind of a complicated one yeah that is a kind of complicated one um it doesn't seem like he ever got married or, or had any children or anything like that um he he died in 1912 in Ashtabula as quite an old man um I don't know what he died of but I I know that he was he was pretty far on in age so he lived a nice long life up there in Ohio I can take maybe one more before we need to oh <laughs> Uh, how did he find out about the Underground Railroad? Is So I guess yeah, that's a so, general question about how a lot of people found out about the Underground Railroad. Yeah, um, so people, especially people who lived in um, the sort of the parts of the southern states that were closest to states like Pennsylvania, so those northern parts of the southern states, um, they would have probably been aware of, you know, people going to maybe find a certain person who could help them out. Uh, but a lot of people never really found the Underground Railroad so much as they just found people who helped them along the way. Uh, or they went north until they found someone who figured out what was going on and helped them. Um, it wasn't so much that he found this one person who put him on the path. He could have gone on many, many paths. And it was just because he found those people that he ended up going the way that he went, if that makes sense. It's quite complicated story. Um, all right, I just want to be mindful of everyone's time. I'm sure there's a lot of questions in there that we unfortunately couldn't get to. Um, I will take a look at them and see if there were any that uh, I can answer um, in the description of the YouTube or something like that. But we're going to go ahead and wrap up now. Um, I thank you all so much for joining. I thank you all uh, for asking questions and commenting in the chat and things like that. Um, we will send around the cahoots and the recordings later. And um, yeah, thank you all so much for joining us. I hope you all learned something and I hope you enjoy the rest of your day.